it. First Corinthians chapter number, no, not first, second Corinthians chapter number five, verse number 17. So I've decided to continue uh, what we did last week, which is extravagant love. So today's extravagant love part two. And I'm trying to urge you that Jesus is the only extravagant lover. If you have one, we are happy for you. If you are the one, we love you. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is the only extravagant lover that all of us should love and fall in love with him. If you have one, we are happy for you. If you are one, we love you. Here's how we define an extravagant lover. We have said an extravagant lover is one who takes pleasure in giving more expensive, inexpensive quantities more than it's necessary. Anyone who needs such a lover? The one who can give you what? More expensive things. More than necessary. In excessive amounts. If we found a woman like that, I need her. More, what is that? More expensive. In excessive quantities. More than it's necessary. That extravagant. And Jesus gives us exactly that. He would give you hugs, he would give you kisses, he would give you more blessing, he would give you security, he would give you protection, he would give you things beyond what you need. That's why we need to fall in love with him. And in this series, we have traced certain things that he has given to us in the process of being born again. I'm sitting in this text because I want you to become confident in your salvation, and also to know what your salvation gives to you. One of the problems that we have in the modern 21st century is Christians who don't know what has happened to them. And he who knows, and knows not that he knows, the Greek phrase says he's a fool. And he who knows not, and he who knows, and knows that he knows, they say he's wise. Knowledge is functional to the level of your awareness of its ability to produce change in you. So we need to know, why am I saying I'm saved? What are the advantages of saved? What happened to me? Why should I have confidence that God will provide to me what he said he would provide? It comes from the awareness of knowledge that it becomes experiential. So let's go back to our text. It's important that we go through it. So we started verse number 17. Ready? Let's read together. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse number 18. All, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us ministry of reconciliation. So, so far we have dealt with this. And today we are going to verse number 19. And verse number 19 and says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now let's go through a recap. Now here's what we are saying. And so the verse number 19 that you want to deal with today, we call it a, a confirmatory uh, uh, elucidation. So when you study the text, the text is divided into parts. Every study or every text, when you categorize it, it should start with an opening premise. An opening premise tells you what the story is going to be. If you go to verse number 16, which is the opening premise on what Christ has done, the scripture says, Paul argues first that an opening statement, guys, we have been looking at things the natural way. And we have been interpreting people based on our natural conception of who they are. We now need to change that perspective, that's the argument, and look at people and at Christ differently. 
That's the closing of the opening premise. Having said that, he introduces the concept of discussion. He says, here is the new theme that we need to look at differently. If any man is in Christ, who is he? He's a new creation. So he's establishing how the new creation forms by sitting on a base. We call that base who? In Christ. And it experiences a transformation. What is the transformation? It becomes a new thing. And this new thing has different characteristics. The first characteristic, the old is gone. Put your hand on your chest and say, my old is gone. Now, this is not the old is going or will go. It's gone. Bury it. Agree with the text. You know, it will trouble you in your mind to the level of extent of the belief that it's gone. Let your sins and your past go. Number three, he says, the new has come. The level at which you can become confident about your new future, it's established on your ability to receive that you can become a new thing, do things differently, achieve things differently. And then he goes to verse number 18, he says, and all of these things, guys, are a gift from God. So he establishes that what we attain is not going to be our own effort, it's not going to be our own dis uh, uh, pursuit, it's going to happen to us because God is waking in us. Put your hand on your chest and say, God is waking in me. You see, that's the good news, is that when you are going through struggles and you fail and you fall, I preached a very powerful message. I've never preached it here in Palap. It's called bouncing back. The ability to fall and rise again. Because most of us have been through a religious system that says a righteous person never falls. And what does scripture say? It says a righteous man falls how many times? Seven times. And the study of the Old Testament when it gets to seven, shows you a number of uncertainty. If you are a believer, there are things that are going to take you down. Here's the good news. Whenever you fall down, what should you do? Bounce back. Say to your neighbor, bounce back. But here's the problem. Some of you, one mistake, one crawling, you lie down. With all your chest, and you lie down for years. A righteous man has a bouncing back spirit. I get tripped, I rise up. I rise up until I am certain I would never fall. So the scripture says, it says all things are what? Are new. And all of these things are who? Are from God. And then he goes into the next process that has established that. He says, how did God do these things? He has given us what? Through the process of what? Reconciliation. And he has given us what? The ministry. I wish I had time to talk about that diaconia, that's the Greek word, the ministry of reconciliation. And I'm sitting on that word because it's key. The theme of verse number 16 downwards, other than the new creation, the secondary theme there is the process of reconciliation. In the Greek, it's called katalage. The process that facilitates katalage is called katalos. And I want him to show you that process on the screen so that you may follow what we want to build on because I want you to overgrow noise to get into a relationship with Jesus where you are confident about what is happening. So can you give me the slide on the catalog and catalogs, please, so that we can run this through. Yeah, so the process through which he does that is through the cartilage. Now, the cartilage is the complete process. It represents a process through which an, an, a relationship of enmity is called into a friendship. So that's the Greek for the complete process. So reconciliation in English doesn't represent it well. So in the Greek, cartilage means a complete relationship of enemies that have been turned into a friendship. You and God have been enemies, and through the process of cartilage, you are now a friend of God. We sing a song here called, I am a friend of God. And now, the process of cartilage is being processed through a process called cartelos. Cartelos in the Greek, we don't have it in English, you can't have it in Sotswana. Here's what it means. It exists when the offended, the offended person in the relationship the subject goes or initiates the process of reconciliation. 
is when you have wronged me, and instead of me waiting for you to come and apologize, I go towards you and say, you know what? I'm going to ignore what happens. Let's build this relationship again. That's catalos. Catalos is, I have been offended, but I'm not going to keep the offense, and I'm not going to stay on it and wait for the person to apologize. And I'm saying this because it is important for our understanding of verse number 19. And I'm challenging all of us. How many of you here have been offended? How many of you here have been offended by somebody? Now, here is the biblical way of dealing with offense. I know some of you are waiting for somebody to come and apologize to you. And maybe you have already set up the way in which the apology should come. The biblical way is that the offended should go to the offender and say, hey... Can I add more? So catalos, the subject which initiates the cartilage, the reconciliation process, does that because he believes the object of the catalos process, in other words, the object of the reconciliation is more important never to let go. That's what God is doing to us. Because God is recognizing we have wronged him, we have offended him, we are guilty, we are sinful, but God recognizes how can I let my people go? And he says, you know what? I'm letting away all the offense. I'm going to them to get them. And I challenge husbands, wives, children, fathers, mothers, everyone. Whenever you are in a state where you cannot go to the offended, no, to the, to the one who, offend, who offended you, then it means you don't value the relationship much. You're willing to let it go. God looked at you and said, you know what? I don't want him to go to hell. I don't want to lose him. I would rather lay aside. And that leads me to verse number 19 for today's discussion. I want us to look at it. So verse number 19 says, to wit, this is, this is old King James, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling us unto himself. So I want to teach this in question form so that we do a strong textual criticism. Here's the first question I want us to deal with. What is the role of God in my salvation? Let's ask it in a different way. What is God doing when, he, when I got saved? What is the role of God, especially God the Father, if you want to elevate it to a higher level, in my salvation? The answer, verse number 19, look at it. It says, and God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling us to himself by Jesus Christ. This is why we call it what? A confirmatory elucidation because it explains the process that have been described in verse number 17 and 18. Elucidation means explanation. So when you are listening to parliament and say, elucidation, elucidation, horrible, how do you get? What's the guy who leads the house? Hey, elucidation, Mr. Speaker, is a point of explanation. So Paul is giving us a confirmatory what? Explanation of, guys, this is how the above process is taking place. Is that God was in Christ doing what? Catalosing. That's my English because you don't have it in English. Doing what? Bringing the offender back instead of waiting for the offender to come and apologize. So what is the role of God? He was the one who was working in your heart for you to come to church, for you to accept Christ, for you to say, oh God, I need you. God was at work in you through Christ. Bringing you in as a child. Now, the next question we need to answer is, so he says, verse number 19, to it, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now, there's a two scholastic view over this verse. The first argument is that some other scholars argue that, no, we need to recognize the, the place of God in terms of where God was. The second good of scholars, and both of them are correct, argues that, no, we need to focus on the process through which God was doing it. How was God doing it? In Christ. Where was God doing it? In Christ. So both of them are technically correct. But here's what I want to encourage you to recognize that through Christ, God is functional in you. Now, let's look at how he's doing this process because this, this next phrase would help us understand. So, so verse number, number, no, part 
B of verse number 19. He says, not imputing their transpasses unto them. I want to read it in the NIV because NIV helps us with better English. So it says, not counting people's sins against them. How has God been reconciling us to himself? Now, here's the answer. Look at me. Here's the answer. How does God bring us back to him? Through catalogs. It's not written there. But the process that is explained there represents the, cat the catalogs process. Through catalogs. What does catalogs demand? And I'll show you very soon. What does three things that the catalogs process will demand? That makes part B of the next verse very important. Now, remember in the catalogs, the offended goes to the one who have offended him and said, I can't let you go. And that's what God is saying to you today. You might be having sins and obstacles and things that you are fighting. God is saying, I can't let you go because if I let you go, you're going to die and go to hell. And I don't want you to go there. Now, the catalogs process requires that the offended first should lay aside wrath. And I'm using the Old Testament thinking of wrath. The Hebrew, the Hebrew word for wrath represents a burning fire of anger. Like a burning fire. Like, have you ever had a burning anger? Can, can I talk to real people here? How many of you have had a burning anger? Like, I want to go to her office right now. I want to tell her right now. How many of you have had a burning anger? So, if you want catalogs, the first requirement is give me that slide on laying off anger is lay off the anger so here's what had happened to God God was angry we had sinned we had disappointed us he had put all the glory into us I'm going to be going that into the next he's put everything powerful into us we disappointed and God was angry now here is what the anger of God is burning against and majority of you are religious I want to help you Here's what the anger of God is burning against. It is burning against the fact that if it doesn't come up through for you, you're going to get lost. It is not on the act. It is on the result of the act because sin is going to kill you. The consequences of sin is going to kill you. So God is, is mad that these guys have gone to a place I've said they should not go to and if they are there, the enemy is going to kill them with sicknesses, with the diseases. They're going to experience broken relationship. Life is going to be tough for them because this is not good for them. How can they do these silly things? And God recognized, if I stay in this anger, I'm not going to save them. So as the first process that leads to the reconciliation, God takes off his anger. Wrath. You ask me if there is any recipe for functional relationship, there it is. How many parents are so angry against their children? Laid off. How many children are so angry against their parents? Laid off. How many husbands think that their wives are a nuisance? Lay the wrath down. Anger will destroy you. Because it will make, minimize the value of the object of your pursuit. God said, people are so important to me, I can't let anger control me. Hey, let's put it down. And here's the next thing that he did. It's in part two. So he said to himself, he said, not imputing, not counting people's sins against them. I'm going to put to teach on, uh, uh, on imputing at a later date, but I want you to see the transaction. Not counting people's sins against them. So God recognized, if I love them, if I want them, here's the next thing after I've laid up my anger, I need to stop counting their wrong. And here's the assurance of today's say this. God is not counting your sins against you. And I know you have been taught in your primary school or whatsoever, 
yeah, you know I don't want people mentioning churches here. I think when you are doing your testimony or whatever, let's not mention other churches. I think other churches are good. Yeah, so please, let's respect that. Let's talk about what we are doing here. It's only doesn't. I am a teacher of business etiquette. Some principles are good. And the church said? Amen. Where was I? I think I lost myself. Yeah, so, so God does not count our wrong. And we think that he's sitting somewhere, looking at what we are doing, saying, this is sin. Today's sin, he has a list for your sins today. He is not counting. How, how did God get to arrive at a catalyst process? By not counting people's sins against them. Because if God would count your sins against you, none of us deserves to be here. That's why we love Jesus, because he's merciful, he loves us, and he's aware of our sins, but he wants to embrace us. And here's why God wants us, is to keep us out of sin. Because sin kills people. And I want you to know as a church that God's problem is not sin. Sin will kill you. God wants to save you from sin. And you need to help yourself by coming out of sin. Because the wages of sin is what? It's death. Sin kills. This is why God wants to take it out of the occasion and get you in. Into a place where you can overcome what? Sin. So get the love of God. Most of the people think that when pastors talk about sin, they are taking them, they want to know their bedroom issues. No, the idea is to help you recognize God loves you so much and he knows one thing that can separate you from him for eternity. It's what? Sin. So here's what he's saying. Run to me. And he says, I am the one who is offended, but I'm willing to come to you. Why are you running away from me? Come to me, and I will not ask you questions about what? Sins. Not imputing sins on the people. And I'm going to talk about that Greek word when I deal with the subject. Because that word means that God. He's not crediting. He's not even debiting. But I'm going to be showing you when I talk about the righteousness of Christ. How he would credit into your account better things. And pay for you. So he doesn't count your sins. Why is that important to you? If God can neglect your sins and put them aside, it doesn't mean that sin does not kill. It also need, that doesn't mean that sin would not mislead you. It means God loves you to save you from that. So make it a priority. And, and I'm going to be showing you how he then empowers you to overcome the sin. So that in your life, sin is not an issue. And here's the third theme that is important for the process of catalyst is to display love. Because then the catalyst process requires that the subject goes to the object and say, hey, come in here. Give me a hug. Have you ever been forgiven by a person when you know you are guilty? Even when you are told, give me a hug, you still say, what's the next thing? What does he really want to do? I know he has to embarrass. And, and then we say, well, maybe it's still day one. I'm waiting. Or maybe he's going to say it later. And then day one, and then you get frustrated. But in the process of the catalogs, nothing is being said to you when you are wrong. But here's what the person is not saying. He's not saying continuing. But he's saying, you are so important to me than what we have done. That's how God wants to relate with you. He loves you and he has provided a way out of sin and he wants to embrace you. But when you have done wrong, he's still saying, come. But here's why he pursues you to deliver you from the sin that can destroy you. Because sin will kill you. He's the only killer, as a matter of fact. And God wants us to save from him. That way he displays love. That's why it's important. How many of you have ever seen yourself being blessed by God when you are at your worst? You know why that happens? It's the catalyst. The, offended, the, the offender is in such a bad place that if I don't reach to him with love, he would get so stranded from me, 
to his destruction. So I need to reach out. But here's what, what, how we interpret that process wrong. Oh, God can still bless me when I don't read the word, when I don't pray, when I don't give, when I'm sinful. Oh, then I should continue. That's deception. That's deception. He's doing that to you to say, hey, I still love you. Come here, stay here. I can give you a better life. You understand? So God then leads us through this process by not counting our sins on us. I think I love this. If there's anything that gives me the confidence to keep loving Jesus, saving Jesus, is the fact that he's interested in my being more than he's interested in my sin. But what keeps me from sin is that I have fallen in love with somebody who doesn't count my wrong and gives me an opportunity to do better. It's only the immature whom when they are given grace by their wives, by their partners, by their uh, families, that they continue to explore not to explore, to exploit. God loves you. He hates sin. Sin won't make you better. But he knows when you fall into sin, you get deceived, it destroys you, but he, he doesn't want the sin to separate you. That's why the scripture says, the same guy, Paul says, nothing shall do what? Separate us from the love of God. Can it be death? Can it be sin? Nothing. Why? Why? Because he's willing to lay her aside wrath and not count the sins and display love. How do you reject such a lover? Let's fall in love with Jesus. Let's love him the more. Let's love him more than our sins. Let's bounce back to him every time. And let's be clear, we can overcome sin. Because he who is in us is greater than the one who causes sin. You can overcome that addiction, whatever it is. You can overcome it. You can overcome any type of sin. And I know how you think because you are saying, Pastor, I've been struggling with this one. This one, ah, no. Maybe you are talking about, no, this one has been my friend. No, you can. And you need to make up your mind. I need to overcome this. And when you do that, God gives you grace to get into another dimension where your weakness of 10 years would no longer be part of your life. All of us should be confident in God's plan. I'm going to be showing you very soon in verse number 21 and number 20 how he then makes us different. I love Jesus. I love what he does. I thank God that I can come to the house of God and when I come in walking as if no one should see me, Jesus says, no, I'm not counting the wrongs you have done. I'm only saying be responsible for yourself. As for me, I love you. I want you. I'm not counting the wrong. Overcome the wrong. I want us to stand. And as we stand this morning, can you just ask God where you are? In the place of your weakness? in the place of your sin, God can give you grace. The scripture says, if we confess our sins, here's one of the scriptures, very powerful scripture, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and to give us a new slate. So this morning, don't allow sin to build up, to obstruct you, to have a fellowship with Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Say, Lord, from here, give me grace to fall in love with you more and to know you more and to understand that nothing can separate me from your love. Just lift up your hand where you are. You know your sins. You know what is bothering you. You know what follows you. Ask the Lord to grant you grace. Come on, whisper it or shout it out. Let's all pray. Father, we are before your presence. I surrender my life right into your hands. I ask for grace. To overcome sins that follows me. I ask for grace, oh God, to
to overcome and just emerge from certain habits, certain silly decisions. I pray for strength. I pray for the grace of the Lord Jesus to enable me to conquer them. And Lord, here are men and women standing in your presence. Whatever area of weakness, whatever area of sin in their lives, help them to overcome it and to fall in love with you. In the name of Jesus, I surrender each one of us unto your hands. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Wow. Do you love Jesus? Are you a new born again creature? Love him. And let's hate sin. Let's be intentional about overcoming it. Because God does not count it. He's willing to neglect it. Push it on the side. Focus on Jesus. And let's do more for him. Let's see you next week. Get a visitor into the house of God. They are struggling with sin. And they think God is made on them. Let's tell them. That's the ministry of Catalos. God loves you. And is not made. Thank you for coming. God bless you.